Everyone is here, so we'll just get started here, okay? All right. Well, um, I just want to make a quick announcement that all of the materials from last week's class are now up on the, um, the classroom website, if you want to call it that, okay? Also, some of the main sources that I used, I linked to them for you on the internet so that you can go read them for yourself. Okay, I've got chapter 51 of Gibbon on the Paulicians linked. I've got uh, Schott's chapter on the Paulicians, and I have uh, the work, the book, the Neander book uh, linked to. You're gonna have to scroll through that to find the right pages. Because I couldn't, I couldn't link specifically to the pages that I use, but it is the volume. It's volume three. You can scroll through there and find the material that I used. We updated that. Norm is going back through and updating all the earlier videos where there were six windows, and you had to watch six different windows. We are in the process of, of taking all those down and replacing them with the new one window option, so that somebody can watch the entire each lesson in one window instead of having to watch it in six ten minute windows. So anyway, those things are uh, are being updated and stuff like that. Today, lesson 23, the Christian Middle Ages, uh, Bogomils, Cathars, and the Silver Line of Truth, part two. Last Sunday, we looked at the Paulicians, uh, which I, be I still believe is a key study in this entire thing that we've been going through, okay, because it demonstrates that there have always been people in history that have believed similar things to you and I. Okay? Uh, Edward Gibbon can't even write the history of the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire without talking about people who believe things similar to us. And we talked about that. Now what we're going to look at this week is how those people, we, we discussed their persecution, right? How uh, the Empress Theodora killed 100,000 of them in about 20 years, or I forget the exact time frame, but... When the persecution comes, those believers are going to spread out, okay? And one of the places they're going to spread out to is they're going to, like I said to you last Sunday, they're going to cross the Bosporus Straits across from Asia Minor, Turkey area, into the Balkans on the other side of the Black Sea. When they do that, they are now going to be given a new name. And the new name that they're going to take or be given by their enemies is the term Bogomil, Okay? And so we're going to look at that today and how that line continues on uh, throughout church history. So, point number one. About the middle of the 8th century, Constantine, surnamed, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, okay, either by favor or as a punishment, transplanted a great number of the Paulicians into Thrace, an outpost of the empire, and there they acted as a religious mission. So, that Miller is saying exactly what I said to you last week. That the Paulicians cross over into the Balkans, whether it's due to persecution or whether some of them are transplanted there by the Eastern Byzantine Empire, the bottom line is that they wind up there in that same line of believers and they start to do the same thing there that they were doing in, in, in Armenia, in Asia Minor, uh, east of the Euphrates that we were talking about last week. Okay, So there's a direct connection between the saints in the Balkans that we're going to be looking at today and the ones that we looked at last week, um, the Paulicians. By this immigration, these doctrines were introduced and diffused into Europe. They seem to have labored with great success amongst the Bulgarians. Their history, as the, their, their history after this period is European. They were favored with a free toleration in the land of their exile, which greatly softened their condition and strengthened their community. So when they first cross over into the Balkans, and specifically Bulgaria, they go through a time period of relative peace, okay, for a while. Um, and from there on, this is a key point here, from there on, the history of this group is going to be largely European. Because they are going to, and I'll show this to you today, they're going to spread all throughout the European continent uh, as a result of what's going on here, all right? The Paulician immigrants from Asia Minor made converts and founded churches which spread rapidly. In Slavic regions, they came to be called Bogom, Bogomili, a Slav name meaning friends of God. Derived from the phrase uh, uh, Buga Mili, these, uh, those dear or, uh, or acceptable to God. 
So Broadbent and Broadbent and Miller are both telling you that these Boga mills are essentially displaced Paulicenes, okay, who have migrated across to these areas, whether because of persecution or whether some by choice, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But these groups in the Balkans, and specifically Bulgaria, are basically misplaced Paulicenes, member of the same groups that we talked about last Sunday. Okay, so you should see a chain here in the progression. And this is what we're talking about. Okay, the Paulicenes are here. They move this. They they move westward. They cross the Bosporus here into into uh, the the Balkan area into Bulgaria, and they become known here as the Bogomils. They're going to go up into Bosnia, as we'll see in a few minutes, Herzegovina, Croatia, and they're going to start to spread these things that were believed by the Paulicians back here, like we talked about last Sunday. They're going to start to spread them westward throughout Europe. Okay, so there's a chain here in in the history of how this stuff is going to, is unfolding. All right, now from these Bulgarian settlements, their way was open into Western Europe. Many native Bulgarians associated with them, hence the name Bulgarians. Okay, uh, in a course, in a course or corrupted form, is one of the um, appellations appellations of hatred which clung to the Paulicians in all quarters. So, wait, if you just go back here real quick, these saints here they'll go by a few terms. Some people call them just Bulgarians in some of the books, just because they're from Bulgaria. Some are going to call them Bogomils. But the main point, again, is that whatever they were called, number one, they didn't take that name for themselves. That's a name that was given to them by their enemies, okay? And number two, these saints that we're talking about are, again, misplaced members of the Paulician group that we studied last week, okay? <clears throat> Miller states, as the subsequent religious history of these uh, interesting people, historians are greatly divided. Nothing is known of them but from the writings of their enemies. One thing, however, is certain. They protested against the saint and image worship of the Catholics and the legitimacy of the priesthood with, uh, by which idolatry was upheld. They also protested against many things in the doctrines, the discipline, and the assumed authority of the Church of Rome. So they're doing a lot of the same things. Like we saw last week, all the Catholic writers and the majority of church historians Call them Manichian. All right? Just like they did with the Paulicians last Sunday. So you're going to see a trend here that anybody that disagrees with the Catholic Church is going to be labeled either dualistic, Manichian, Gnostic, or Arian. Okay? Because they don't agree with the fundamental doctrines of the accepted church. Now, I told you last Sunday, we looked at Philip Schaff, and I told you how Philip Schaff was evaluating who was, her who was heretical, right? He's doing it based on where they stand in relationship to the Catholic Church, its teaching and its doctrine, and what he calls the historic church. So all these groups, the Paulicians, the Bogomils, they're essentially the same group, are all going to be labeled with the same terms by the people that are writing the history. Because again, a lot of what they said in their own words is going to be totally destroyed by the people that are persecuting them. Uh, Cosimus, a Bulgarian presbyter, writing at the end of the 10th century, describes Bulgarians as worse and more horrible than demons. Okay? Denies their belief in the Old Testament or the Gospels, says they pay no honor to Mary, uh, the mother of God, nor to the cross. They revile the ceremonies of the church and all church dignitaries, call Orthodox priests blind Pharisees, and say that the Lord's Supper is not kept according to God's commandment, and that the bread is not the body of God, but ordinary bread. Okay? So then again, this is a Catholic Bulgarian presbyter this is telling you what he says the, Bog the Bogomils believed. Now, is that essentially the same thing we saw last Sunday with the Paul Scenes? Yeah. It's almost exactly the same. Okay? Byzantine persecution drove many of the believers westward into Serbia. And the strength of the Orthodox Church in Serbia pushed them further into Bosnia. They continued active on the eastern side of the peninsula and in, in, in Asia Minor. So I just want to go back quick to this map. What we're just reading there is exactly what this map is illustrating. 
Okay? Persecutions are going to continue to force the, these believers northwestward. And as they go, they're bringing their same beliefs with them that we're discussing here. Okay? Now, does anybody have any questions about that before we go any further? Okay, good. In 1140, so suppose Bogomil error, error was found in the writings of Constantine uh, Caracas, I don't even know how to say this guy's name, and condemned at a, at a synod or snoid in Constantinople. The teachings objected to was the church, was that church baptism is not effectious. Now remember, what did we study last week about the Pauliceans? What do they believe about water baptism? That it's not for today. Okay? So, the Bogomils, when they're condemned by a church, uh, a, a church meeting in Constantinople, what is the church meeting condemning them for? They're condemning them for teaching that church baptism is not effectual. Alright? That nothing done by unconverted persons, though baptized, is of any value. That God's grace is received by the laying out of hands, but only in accordance with the measure of faith. In 1143, a, a, a synod at Constantinople deposed the Cap Cappadocian bishops uh, on the charge of being bogomans. So again, is the church targeting this group as a specific group that is aberrant or heretical? Alright? Due to the... In Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Due to the incessant persecution... Eventually, many of the saints in Bulgaria put themselves under the protection of the Catholic Church. However, the saints in Bosnia and Herzegovina fared much better. Eventually, what happens here, folks, is some of the people finally just say, forget it. We'll just, it's not worth it. You know, we're, we're being killed and massacred and everything else, and we're just going to go along with the, the flow to save our own, our own selves. And that definitely happens here. Some of those are going to keep moving in an attempt to try to find better circumstances, and for a while they're going to find it in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, how many have ever heard of Herzegovina before? The only place you've ever heard of that ever in history is the beginning of World War II, or one. I'm sorry, when uh, the Bosnians assassinate the, the Archduke, and work the beginning of World War One is going to start in the Balkan area. All right, but. It's actually going to be a haven for a while for some believers. By the 12th century, there were, all, there were already many Bogomils living within the borders of Catholic Bosnia. In 1180, the Catholic ban, now that's what they called their leaders, okay, in, uh, in Bosnia, uh, was addressed by the Pope as a faithful adherent of the church. But by 1199, so 19 years later, it was widely known that he and his family, along with 10,000 Bosnians, had joined the Bogomil Church within Bosnia. Okay? So, within 19 years, because of the work of these Bogomils, the ban, the bond, however you want to say it, converts to their doctrine, and about 10,000 Bosnians join them and are allowing these, these groups to practice very openly and freely their, their beliefs within the, within the borders of Bosnia. Now, who's not going to put up with that? The church is not going to put up with that. Okay? Um, Minislav, prince of Herzegovina, took the same stand as did the Roman Catholic bishop, bishop of Bosnia. The country ceased to be Catholic and experienced a time of prosperity that has remained proverbial ever since. There were no priests other than the priesthood of all believers was acknowledged. And the churches were guided by elders who were chosen by lot, several in each church, and an overseer. Okay? So are these, are these guys more closely following the pattern of how the local church should function that we studied back in Lessons 6 and 7? Okay? So are they rejecting the hierarchy of the church, the Catholic church? All right? They are functioning at a more localized, well, I'm just going to say organic level, then the, then the established Catholic Church was functioning. So again, that's a clue to how these groups thought the local church should function. They did not view themselves as, as just one more level in a big hierarchical structure. They viewed themselves as having local control, appointing their own elders, their own bishops, 
and having a multiplicity of elders, just like we studied Paul taught in his epistles. Okay? Now, here the, the church is going to get mad. Pope Innocent III, with the help of the... Pope Innocent. <laughs> Pope Innocent III, with the help of the King of Hungary, brought such pressure to bear on Curl and Ban that at a meeting in 1203 between the Pope's envoys and the Ban, the Bosnian leaders agreed to submit the Roman, to the Roman Church. They promised never again to relapse into heresy, but to erect an altar and a cross in each other places in each of their places of worship, and to have priests who should read the Mass and listen to confession and administer the sacraments twice a year. Now look, how how does we talked about this? If in the Middle Ages are the popes essentially dictators? So he doesn't like what's going on in Bosnia, so what does he do? He gets the king of Hungary to put political military pressure on the king of Bosnia to the point that the king of Bosnia just says, fine. Well, well you're right. He gets him to basically recant and say that he's relapsed into heresy and makes him to agree by putting military political pressure on him to go ahead and submit to the demands of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Pope. Now, should that... Based on what we've looked at so far, should that surprise you? No. I don't think that should surprise you at all. Though under pressure of the threat of war, the man and the rulers of the country made such an agreement, the people entirely refused to accept it or to be bound by it in any way. Amen. The peace which Kerlin Bond, uh, Q and Bond purchased by yielding to Rome was not of long duration. For he could not compel his people to observe its terms. So, are the believers in the churches going along with this? No, they refuse to submit. Now, on his death in 1216, what does the Pope do? The Pope appointed a Roman Catholic leader, interestingly enough, and sent a mission to convert the Bosnians. Convert them to what? Catholicism. Catholicism. All right. The churches of the country, however, increased the more and spread into Croatia, Dalmatia, um, Isteria, uh, Cronolia, and Slovenia. So all of those Slavic states that are over there in the Balkan region, they are going to begin to have bogomils coming into their territories as a result of these persecutions. So every time the church organized churches persecuting these believers, are they ever able to totally stamp them out? No, because they just move somewhere else. Some six years later, the Pope, despairing, watch this, despairing of converting the Bosnians by other than forcible means, and encouraged by the success of his crusades in, in uh, Provencia, ordered the king of Hungary to invade Bosnia. The Bosnians deposed their Roman Catholic band and elected a Bogomil to be their leader. So, was this belief system strong enough in this area, number one, to initially attract the leader of the country to convert to it before the Catholics threatened him, and number two, for the people later on to elect their own uh, governmental representation of this uh, as a member of this group who was a Bogomil. So, meanwhile, with constant pressure of Islam becoming an increasing danger to Europe and Hungary, uh, and Hungary was in the forefront of the fight, yet this did not awaken the Catholic countries to see the folly of destroying a barrier between them and their most dangerous foe. So, understand what, what he's saying. As the Muslims are coming, the Muslim armies are coming. Are the Catholics worried about that? No. Oh yeah, they're worried about it. But they're not worried about it enough to stop persecuting the Bogomils because here come the Muslims. You follow on that? So they're more concerned with rooting out the, the supposed heretics from their midst than they are with, with 
allow with sort of at least militarily uniting with them and you and helping them fight the Muslims. That's how upset they are. You know what this kind of reminds me of? This kind of reminds me of Hitler when the Allies landed in France. He still gave priority rail traffic to the deportation of Jews to the death camps than he did over moving his army over over Europe. Because he was so fixated on what he was trying to do with the Holocaust that he made decisions that gave that priority over how he was going to move and, and allocate his forces to fight the Allies who had just landed in France. So the Catholics here cannot see past the hatred that they have for these for these groups that are not part of the church. Let's finish that point. The struggle between Christendom and Islam swayed to and fro on its long battlefront, but whenever the papal party prevailed, persecution in Bosnia began afresh. So that in 1450, some 40,000 Bogomils with their leaders crossed the frontier into Herzegovina. So they're more concerned with that. Once again, last point here on this page, once again, some of the believers threw in their lot with the Muslims due to the ferocity of the persecutions leveled against them by the Catholics. So, like we saw last week, some of the believers said, you know what? We're, we already know we're dying here in large numbers. So they aligned themselves militarily with the Muslims, some of them, just like we saw last week when they took when they were fighting over there in Asia Minor. Um, so, any questions about any of this? It's interesting to me that the, you have a similar thing with the Baptists, the Anabaptists. They were insisting that you needed to be baptized again. But some of those protested that and changed their name to Brethren. That's where we get the whole Brethren Fellowship. Uh, basically, they were Baptists. Uh, yeah. And it's, so it's not uncommon for them to, uh, they have made some concessions, basically, to stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> Brethren in Bosnia had contact, now this is important, with their fellow believers in Italy, in the south of France, in Bohemia on the Rhine and in other parts reaching even to Flanders and England. So these persecuted saints in the Balkans had contact with, had relationship with other communities of similar believers that were spread throughout southern France, northern Italy, and the Rhine area of Germany, reaching in some cases all the way into Flanders and parts of England. Okay? So these saints are not just, they're not just a, a totally isolated group of people that had no contact with people throughout the rest of Europe. Alright? These friends of God in Bosnia had, have left little literature behind. So that there remains much to be discovered of their doctrines and practices. But it is evident that they made a vigorous protest against the, uh, the prevailing evils of Christendom and endeavored with the utmost energy to hold fast to the teachings and example of the primitive churches as portrayed in the scriptures. Amen. Their relations, last point there in that section, their relations with other churches in Armenia and Asia Minor, the Albigensians in France, Waddensians and others in Italy, and Hussites in Bohemia, show that there was a common ground of faith and practice which united them. The heroic, the heroic stand for, uh, for four centuries against overwhelming adversity, though unrecorded, must have yielded examples of faith and courage of love unto the death, second to none, the world's, second to none in the world's histories. They formed a link connecting the primitive church in the Tar Taurus Mountains of Asia Minor with similar ones in the Alps of Italy and France. Their land and nation were lost to Christendom because of the inner uh, intervet persecution to which they were subjected. So they are a, they, if, if if you think about the map, a map of the world, that's Italy. Okay, I know this is really going to be a great map. All right, 
that this is Asia Minor, and this is the Balkans, the policy has come out of Asia Minor, and then the Bogomils are going to be doing all their thing over here in the Balkans, and then from there they're going to be branching out and spreading out all throughout the rest of Europe. And so they are sort of a <coughs> middle chain, if you will, and a link connecting the truth all the way back up to the very region where Paul started his apostolic journeys in the book of Acts. You follow that? Any questions before we look at their beliefs specifically? Now, as they were doing that and going, going west, were they, was the Catholic Church coming at them constantly, trying to dismantle them? And Everywhere they went, the church eventually went after them. Now, if you know anything about the geography here, in northern Italy, southern France, Austria, you have a big mountain range called the Alps. Right? Next week we're going to look at a group, at some groups that <clears throat> for quite a long time found relative seclusion from all this living way up in the, in the, in the mountains of, of, of the Alps region. But eventually the church is going to go after them too. And when they do, more of those people are, are going to be killed than any of the other groups. Okay. But that's partly because they were one of the bigger groups, too. The Wadensians. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming from what you said last week about them having the multiplicity of um, Scripture, they had a lot more of it available to these groups that we're talking about now than they, the Catholic Church has ever allowed out. So, would you say that at least every church or every small group had a copy of scripture? Or? I would say at least. And that's just the numbers of manuscripts that have survived. Because you've got to remember, if the church is persecuting them with all the ferocity of the power that they are being offered to them, they're not just killing them, but they're destroying whatever writings, whatever they can get their hands on, they're killing or destroying. It's the same thing, you know, the, uh, when, when the Pope, when the Pope uh, put a, a papal uh, um, bull for excommunicating Martin Luther, it didn't just say we kicked Martin Luther out of the church. It said that it gave the German princes the authority to burn, and the, the, the papal bull literally says to erase the, marks, the works of Martin Luther out of the memory of man. They're doing the same thing all along. And so that text, that, that, that Byzantine text, that majority text, that Receptus text that backs up the King James Bible is the text that these folks are dying for. Meanwhile, you guys, how many of you have ever heard of Sinaiticus Manuscript? It's one of the so-called oldest and best manuscripts, right? Where, where did they find that manuscript? In a Catholic monastery around Mount Sinai, did any believer ever hold in their hand that manuscript and die for it? No. It was locked away in some Catholic monastery that no one ever saw. So the text of the Scripture that the saints are literally giving their blood for is the one that you have in your hand right now. That's why this, this King James issue ultimately is also such a big deal. Because what is it that's going to drive the Protestant Re the Protestant Revolution? It's going to be the it's going to be that text being translated into the language of the people. That's what's going to drive it. And look, you, the scholars can come and they can tell me why I'm wrong and why the oldest manuscripts are better and blah 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 and hither and yon. I don't care because I'll show you why I don't care. Go Second Corinthians chapter two. The prevailing wisdom, folks, when it comes to the issue of manuscripts, is that the older ones are better. You ever heard that before? If you read the notes, uh, let me read to you a note also in my Schofield Reference Bible, uh, Mark 16. I'll read you the note first. Mark 16. Modern versions say that from verse 9 to the end should be left out of the book of Mark, at the end of Mark 16. The passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts. The Sinaitic. Which one's that? 
found. That's the one I just told you about that they found it in, that they found in a monastery in Mount, Mount Sinai. So the passage from verse nine to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Sinaitic and the Vatican. Where's that one at? <laughs> so the two best witnesses, according to the prevailing scholarship in Christendom, are two Catholic manuscripts that no believer ever had in their hand and died for. Because they were locked away somewhere and no one ever saw them. And so when they're, quote, discovered in the middle of the 1800s, it's this big revolutionary find. And the idea is then put forth that because these manuscripts are older, they are therefore what? Better. Better. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 2.17. Paul says, For we are not as what? Many. Many which corrupt the word of God. Well, wait a minute. Are they already corrupting the word when Paul writes that verse? So, if you're going to let the Bible be the thing that guides you in making decisions, Will you ever, on the basis of a verse, say that older automatically means better? You will not. Because that verse says that just because something is old doesn't mean it's not been what? Corrupted. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that the preservation of the Word would occur through a multiplicity of copies. Right? Well, where do you see that? You see that in this Byzantine type that these saints are dying for. So that's a long answer to your question, uh, Beverly. Does it help you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions? Look, i just got to be honest with you. That's why this stuff about the Paulicians is, to me, such... It, it's critical in two ways. Number one, tracing back the spiritual heritage of grace believers, like we're trying to do. But it's also critical in, in putting together the, the, the how to identify where that Bible text actually was. And who actually had it and who was actually using it. And one of the reasons why there's so many manuscripts is because they had to make so many copies because of the persecution that was being leveled against them was so ferocious and so um, consistent that they had no other choice but to do that. It's interesting, that. Pastor, that word corrupt actually uh, means to make trade of, and that's actually what's happening today. Way back then, they knew where the money was. That's why you have a, a new Bible every month. You got an automatic bestseller. That's right, and uh, it's uh, it's that's the corruption was they were making trade of it. And what does Paul say in Second Second Thessalonians chapter two? He says, um, "Don't." I better just read it to you. Because I'll screw it up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.2. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by what? letter as from who? So what does that tell you, folks? Were people in the first century circulating false letters claiming to have been written by the Apostle Paul? So the, the whole... Listen, I want you to go to one more verse. Go to 1 Corinthians. This whole idea that older is better. If I... If we're talking about Plato, if we're talking about Homer... If we're talking about Thucydides, if we're talking about any other work of antiquity or ancient document, I would say, fine. That makes sense. But I would not say that for the Word of God, because that's not what God's Word says about where you're going to find His Word. You see the difference? See, what's the difference between this book and any other book that you have on your shelves at home? Well, number one, it's written by inspiration of God, right? And number two, because of that, Satan hates it, and he's been trying to destroy the final authority and integrity of God's Word since Genesis 3, when he came to Eve and said, Hath God not said? Right? 
And how does he do that? He does that by putting up a competing authority. So therefore causing you and I to have to make a choice of what our authority is going to be. Okay? So this whole older is better stuff, verse 1 Corinthians 1, 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of who? The wise. The wise. I will bring in nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made what? Foolish. Foolish the wisdom of this world. In the world's wisdom, does it make sense that if you want to reconstruct the text of the Bible, that you go out and find the oldest one? Yeah. But the trouble is, that's not what God said about how He was going to do it. So again, the wisdom of the wise is confounded by simply believing God's Word. Okay? Now, we just spent 15 minutes on that. And I wasn't planning on doing that, but that's fine. Okay? That's, that's an important deal there. I want to look now at the Bogomil beliefs. All right? The Bogomils, like the Paulicines, are depicted as heretics in most church history books. All right? Jonathan Hill... Author of the Zondervan Handbook to the History of Christianity makes the following accusations regarding the beliefs of the Bogomils. He says they're dualists. What did they say about the Paulicians last week? They were dualists. Uh, he's oh, they're, those heretics are vegetarians. <laughs> How dare they? Okay. They rejected the use of anything material in the church: icons, relics, bread, wine, and so on. They claim that they rejected marriage. Which I don't know of any Bible-believing person that's going to reject the institution of marriage. Um, they say that saints, priests, and sacraments have no role in religion. And they, he also says that they were inspired by the Paulicene refugees. Okay? So, what I want you to see here is the same things that they said about the Paulicians, they are now saying about who? The Bogomiths. All right? While commenting on the Cathars, <clears throat> in another chapter, Hill writes the following. The Cather uh, movement was something of a mixed bag, containing a number of different elements, but it was essentially a development of vocalism. The Gnostic heresy in Eastern Europe that we saw in chapter 5. So there he's calling them what? Gnostic. What do they call the Paulicians last week? Gnostic. Okay? Uh, for the Bogomils... They, let me start over, from the Bogomils, they, the Cathars, inherited a belief in two great opposed principles of good and evil. Now, I've been thinking about that a lot this week, too. As, as, as dispensationalists, how do we view the Scripture? That God has a plan, and who's trying to counteract that, the implementation of that plan? Satan. The name Satan itself means adversary, folks. We, we, when we went last year, or two years ago, we went over a class on uh, Satan and his plan of evil. We went through some of that stuff. Okay, um, But even that whole idea, I think, is uh, there, there's a connection there. Kenneth Scott Lorette, <coughs> author of History of Christianity, beginnings to 1500, once again echoes the standard party line regarding the Bogomils. Lorette makes the following statements regarding the Bogomils. Please, if you would. The Bulgarian church was also troubled by a religious movement which is known as Bogomilism. This seems to have arisen in the 10th century and also declared to have been indebted to the Paulicians. Well, these guys are making the argument for me here, folks, that these guys are related to who? Paulicians. The Paulicians. Declared to have been indebted to the Paulicians, even to have a more, even to have been a continuation of them. That set of sturdy religious groups who we met earlier in chapter eleven, and who were um, condemned by the Orthodox as heretics, they have been active. There have been active Paulicians in the Balkan area from at least the time of the eighth century, uh, and contagion from them is quite within the range of possibility. Bogomils had in it Christian, Bogomilism had in it Christian elements which uh, were set in a basic context of dualism, 
such as we have repeatedly seen in our story. So again, they're calling them dualists. Notice again, it rejected the Old Testament. Typo here. Uh, from the latter told creation of the present, of the present uh, evil world by God, it accepted the New Testament, but rejected, but rejected the miracles of, of healing by Christ. Uh, okay. Um, can you necessarily believe any of this stuff? <laughs> Can you necessarily believe any of the stuff that these guys are saying? No. Why? Has any of their writings survived? Now, look at this. Numerous Catholic sources online okay, report the following regarding the Bogomil's view of baptism. Baptism was only to be practiced on grown men and women. The Bogomil's repudiated infant baptism and considered the baptismal right to be of a spiritual character, neither by water nor by oil. Now, does that sound like the Pauline's we looked at last week? Okay. Now, let's, let's go on to the next one. Now, because the Bogomils believed all matter was evil, they denied the miracles that Jesus performed. So now they're taking their supposed belief in the it, the, the Bogomil's supposed belief that matter is evil and using it to say the following, that they don't believe that Jesus did any miracles. Now because Bogomil's, Bogomil's believed all physical matter was evil, they denied the miracles Jesus performed, including the multiplication of loaves and the physical healing ministry. They rejected the Old Testament, gave priority to the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. They rejected infant baptism, not because of some complex justification and grace theology, but because they denied all water baptism. Now, isn't that an interesting little tidbit? Water being a physical substance was evil. In fact, Lambert describes that any previously baptized person who had left the Orthodox Church for the Bogomils was required to undergo a purification ceremony to, re to, to reverse the evil effects of water baptism. And that... I mean, look, you can't, I can't make this stuff up even if I wanted to, okay? According to Schaff, so here we go, here's our boy Schaff again. According to Schaff, the Bogomils held to the uh, Sablarian, I've never really even had a clue what that is, Trinity, rejected the Eucharist and substituted for baptism with water a ritual prayer and the imposition of, and the imposition of hands. You should see a couple things here. Number one, do these guys even all agree amongst themselves about what they believe? No. But there's one thing that is common throughout all of this is they're calling them heretical because one of the reasons is because they refuse what? Water baptism. That civilian at Trinity there is basically a Jesus only thing. They baptized in the name of Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the name. So it's not three distinct persons, but they combined it to one. Which, by the way, is what Oral Roberts taught. Hmm. And many of your Pentecostals teach that. That's interesting. So now we just, now here's sort of uh, Ruckman's take. The Bogomils were anti-Catholic. In church history, those who are anti-Catholic have to be either heathen or heretics. Because most church historians, most church histories are written by people who are who major in anti-church history. Throughout the entire anti-church history of Catholicism, every group who believed what the Bolshevils believed was called Arian, Manichean, Dualistic, or Gnostic. They appear mainly in northern Italy and southern France, and when they do, this is important, their names have been changed against in order. Their names have been changed against in order to cut off from history any biblical succession which would connect them with the New Testament. Now, I personally find that to be a fascinating point. Because why aren't the Pauliceans called the Pauliceans when they get to Bulgaria? Why aren't the Pauliceans called the Pauliceans when they get to northern Italy or southern France? Why are they then known by a different name? They don't want to see the carrying over. Because if they're all named the same name, then you have a clear, delineated line through history of all of these groups who all trace their spiritual heritage all the way back to who? Paul. To Paul. 
But the teaching of the organized church is that who's the head of the church? Peter was, and that all of the popes inherit the throne or the seat of Peter. So they change their names in every location so as to make it seem like the only true biblical succession is the Catholic line. These are sneaky devils, I'm telling you. Okay, these guys are these guys are stacking the deck. Is what they're doing. All right, the Cathari. Now, I've heard some writers will say Cathari, some will say Cathars, but they're all essentially talking about the same group. We got 15 minutes, and I think we should have time to get through this. In France and Italy, these groups are called Cathari. In southern France, these Cathari were called Albigensians, and in the Balkans, they were called Bulgarians. The trick in every case was to produce the impression that the true New Testament that the yeah, let me start over. the impression that the true New Testament succession was Catholic because of the because the godless reprobates in the political organization had stuck to one name since they adopted it, uh, while the other groups couldn't possibly prove New Testament succession because their names changed. By changing the names of anti-Catholic Bible believers constantly, you could prove that your church, the Catholic church, was the one true church. This is a name game thing going on there. Okay? Now listen, according to the Catholic Dominican, Rhenesis, at the time of the Crusades, there were four million Cathari spread throughout Europe. Now that's a Catholic source saying that at the time of the Crusades there were four million of these believers spread throughout Europe. Once again, Schaff articulates the standard party line regarding the Cathari. Please look at the following sources, the quotes that are in your notes. Number one. The most widely distributed of the heretical sects were the Cathari. The term comes from the Greek word uh, katharoros, meaning pure, and, is, and has given to the German its word for heretic. It was first used by the Cathari themselves, a grotesque uh, derivation invented by their enemies associated the sect with the cat, this is all goofy stuff here, okay? Whose form it was the pleasure of the devil to assume. So Schaff is just like way out there. From their dualistic tenets, they were called Numenetian. And from the, from the quarter they inhabited in Milan, called uh, Pretoria. This is kind of hard to follow, I apologize for that. But he's kind of really screwy when it comes to this stuff. Number two, in southern France they were called Albigensians from the town of Elbii, one, one, of the cent one of the centers of their strength. From the territory in Eastern Europe, once their theological tenets were drawn, they were known as Bulgarii, um, uh, Bergeres, and Burgers. Other titles were given to them in France, such as uh, Tessacerants and Texteros. <laughs> From their strength among the weavers and industrial classes, the uh, publicii, uh, blah, 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 a corruption of who? Now, you see, you see, how many different names do they have for them in just two, two paragraphs? I can't even read them and keep it all straight. But if you follow the one thing you can follow, he's saying that the Cathars are related to the Bogomils in Bulgaria who are related to who? Paul Sands. Next one, it was the general belief of the age that the Cathari derived their doctrinal views from the heretical sects of Eastern Europe and the Orient, such as the Paulicenes and the uh, Bogomili. This was brought out of the testimony of members of the sect at their trials, and it has in, it has in its favor the official recognition of the leaders of Eastern Europe, Bosnia, and Constantinople gave to the Western heretics. The Cathari agreed to use the expression <coughs> of their opponents. Um, 
some of this, I don't even know what he's talking about. Uh, to establish to, uh, the established church and calling them, it's in here, it's Romanists. There are two churches they held. So this is what he's saying that they, they believe. One uh, of the wicked and one of the righteous. They themselves constituted the church of the righteous, outside of which there is no salvation, having received the imposition of hands and done penance according to the teaching of Christ and the apostles. Uh, its fruits proved that the established church was not the true church. The true church uh, endures persecution, does not uh, prescribe it. The Roman church sits in the, in the place and rule, notice, and is clothed in purple and fine linen. The true church teaches first. The Roman church baptizes first. The true church has no dignitaries, prelates, cardinals, archdeacons, or monks. Now look at this. The Roman Catholic Church is the woman of the apocalypse, a harlot, and the Pope, the Antichrist. So why are the Cathari heretics? Because they're not Roman Catholic and they properly identified the woman of Revelation 17 and the church doesn't like it. Renun <clears throat> last one. Renunciation of the seven sacraments, baptism with water was pronounced a material and corruptible thing, the work of an evil God. Even little children were not saved who received absolution and the, impos uh, and the imposition, I think that should say hand, sorry about that. The baptism of the established church was the baptism of John the Baptist, and John's baptism was an invention of the devil. Christ made a clear distinction between baptism with water and baptism with power. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it highly fascinating that when they go about calling these guys heretics, what comes up over and over and over again? <coughs> the fact that they didn't practice what? Water baptism. Now, they have all sorts of explanations and different concoctions as to why... But you can't get around the fact that they don't do this. Now, Bruce Shelley, author of Christian History or Church History in Plain Language, follows Schaff in repudiating the Cathari as Gnostic and dualistic. Like the Gnostics in the early church, the Cathari held that the universe in the, in, is the sense of an, an eternal conflict between two powers, one good, the other evil. Matter, including the human body, is the work of this evil power, the God of the Old Testament. He had, they claimed, imprisoned the human soul in its earthly body. The Cathari were an immense peril to the Roman church. Not only had they revived the ancient dualistic heresy, but by 1200 they had gained the protection of the prince of Toulouse, a cultural area in southern France, and were spreading at an alarming rate. Three weapons were at the church's disposal. Preaching to return them to the truth, a crusade to crush all the hardened resistance, and the inquisition to uproot heresy completely. <clears throat> what have we seen? Is there a direct connection between the Paulistines and the Bolgamites? Is there a connection between the Bogomils and the Cathari who spread all throughout Europe? They all believe, none of them are practicing water baptism, they all are anti-Catholic, anti-Pope, anti-Church. They reject the Catholic sacraments. They are using a Bible that is contrary to the uh, Latin Vulgate text. They don't practice water baptism. And they are all being related to each other. The names are all changed so as to avoid the, the, uh, the perception of any type of continuation. And all of that is being done by who? The, the established church. Okay? Now I've got to confess to you that when I read the stuff here... I don't, to what level we can trust what Schaff says, I think is skeptical at best. Okay? But what you need to do when you read this stuff is look for trends. 
You need to look for common links. You need to look for things that are being said by everybody all across the board. And the things that are being said across the board are they're anti-Catholic, they're anti-sacraments, they're anti-church hierarchy, they don't practice water baptism, they have, they're ordaining their own elders and all these things which are not a part of the Roman system. And they view, for the one source just said that they viewed the woman of Revelation 17 as the church. So you can see why the ruling Catholic authorities could not tolerate these people in their midst. Because they are basically teaching and preaching against the church. Now, before we get to the concluding remarks, does anybody have any questions or comments? You know, yeah. I was reading that hateful power book, and in regards to the destroying all the books you were talking about, there was a time in there, 13th, 14th century, something like that. The Catholic Church put a ban on literature, too. Good. They had, they had, I forget what yep. they call that. The list of forbidden books. Yeah. And guess what one of them was? Well, the Bible. Was. The church bans the Bible. Now that's an oxymoron for you if there ever was one. And who do they who do they hate more than anybody else? We'll get to this guy in a few weeks. A little guy from England named John Wycliffe, who does what? Translate. Translates the Bible into English. Burned him at the stake. They burned him at the stake. They were so mad at him that they exhumed his bones and burned him again. <laughs> <laughs> and threw, the, threw it into the river. Huss, they do the same thing to Huss. They would have done, and they would have done. You bet, you bet your bottom dollar, they would have done the same thing to Luther if Prince Frederick hadn't stepped in and hit him away in Wartburg Castle. Amen. And when he's in hiding in Wartburg Castle, he commits the act of ultimate sedition to the church, and he translates the Bible into German. Yeah. While he's hidden away, and while he's, and then from there, that Bible then is going to be what printed. printed. You know, he he takes that Bible to Prince Frederick, and he says, "I got a present for you." <laughs> and the prince go, the prince says, "You know that this is going to be viewed as an act of treason, and it's going to formally break our ties with Rome once and for all." And Luther basically says, "Yeah, I know," and. The prince says, well, as long as you know, can I have my present now? <laughs> you got to, but you got to think about that. That guy had never read the Bible. And the average monk, the average priest, the average Roman Catholic, some of the cardinals and bishops had never even read the Bible. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Including remarks. So there's the map again. So hopefully this map is making more sense to you now. As these groups are spreading. You can see the Cathars over here. Okay. Next week we're going to talk about these guys. The Waddensians are going to be up in here. Then we'll talk about Huss. Um, and then we'll kind of have a meanwhile back at the ranch lesson of what's going on during, in the church during this. The Catholic church during all this stuff. But that's looking ahead. Lorette's comments... On the Cathari, as elders, establish a clear connection between the Cathari, Bogomils, and Paulicians. All three groups are called dualists, Manichians, believing in two churches, as well as being accused of rejecting the Old Testament. We must always remember, folks, who is labeling these saints heretics. Okay? We've already demonstrated in great detail the anti-scriptural nature of the Catholic Church. Did we not go over their claim that Peter was in Rome? Did we go over that? Did we go over their claim about Matthew 16, about Peter being the one the church is built on? We've gone over all of these things already to demonstrate to you that they are, not only are they not true, but they are actually contrary to what? Scripture. We've already demonstrated in great detail the anti-scriptural nature of the Catholic Church. In addition, we have demonstrated how the organized church sought to remove all memory of these believers from history. They have not been allowed to speak for themselves, had the uh, and had the testimony of their 
Sorry, and the testimony of their accusers cannot be trusted. We have already seen in multiple cases where the church manufactured lies, as in the case of Priscillian and St. Patrick, to justify their harsh treatment of Bible-believing Christians. This is why I called this class, folks, Church History, A Tale of Two Churches. Because that's fundamentally what you have. You have an apostate church system, and then you have the true Bible-believing Christians over here. Now, they do differ from time and place in the details of what they believe. But you still have a, another group who all along refused to be a part of that system. Alright? Standard church histories are written from a Catholic perspective, which labels all those who dissented as heretics who needed to be destroyed. Schaff, Lorette, and Hill, and their truth, and this is, this is a key point, have abandoned God's Word as the final authority when studying church history. This is why we spent so much time at the beginning of this class tracing the true nature of the church and its early removal from the authority of Paul. Without a biblical perspective, true church history is impossible. The failure of church historians to judge church history through the prism of God's Word rightly divided regulates much of their work to the category of historical fiction at best. One cannot call the history of Roman Catholicism church history unless they have discarded the New Testament before attempting to write. Now that's my words, okay? That's not Ruckman, that's not anybody else. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's why we went over, remember back in Lesson 5, 6, and 7, when I said, what is the church in the Bible? And we studied what the church is, the universal church. Then we looked at what is the local church. Then we looked at the nature of what the local church is. Remember that? And then we looked at how the churches went into apostasy while Paul was still alive. Alive. Because if you abandon God's word as the final, if you, if you say and you go out and do church history and you do it without any, without any, without having the word of God influence what you're doing, you're going to write church history like Philip Schaff, uh, Shelley, and Lorette, and Hill. And you're going to end up calling what quite probably are the true believers, the heretics, because you've abandoned the Word of God. Should you be able to use God's Word and identify who the real heretics are? Yes. yes. They're the ones that are teaching that in order for you to be saved, you need to be baptized as an infant. They're the ones that are teaching that when you take the Eucharist, you are literally eating the body and blood of Jesus. But, you know, I'm just being too controversial and, you know, I'm too close-minded and everything else. Yes, Mike? I guess I'm still having a problem getting over why Shelley and some of these. Shelley teaches at one of our most um, prestigious seminaries just down the street in Chicago. Um, and, and facts are facts. And he's an easy an evangelical. Why would he give us the... Because for me, me, because I don't have a master's degree in history, I can't uh, interpret some of this stuff as well as you can. I just have to read Shelley. I mean, because remember the saying, "All roads lead to Rome." Okay. These guys, even the evangelicals, have allowed themselves to be duped into accepting the fundamental Roman Catholic text as their Bible. So if they can be duped into doing that and accepting the NIV, the New American Standard, or any other modern version as the Bible and then establish the so-called scholarship and textual criticism to back it up, then why would you think they'd be any different when it comes to church history? Because Schaff, I told you last week, Schaff sits on the committee, the revision committee in 1881 that replaces the text of the Reformation with the critical text. 
And he's the same guy that writes in his church history book that the Pauluscenes are heretics because they rejected the historic church. So are these guys really... What are they really? And I know I'm being real controversial and maybe some of you don't like what I'm saying, but what are, fundamentally, what are they really? Are they really evangelical Protestants or are they really closet Catholics? <gasps> Look, I'm not trying to be unkind and uncharitable. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Now, I know they can, they can watch this thing, they can, they can excoriate me six ways from Sunday and tell me that, you know, I'm, I'm rejecting the accepted scholarship and blah, 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 fine, let them. I'm going to stand with this. Amen. Amen. Accepted scholarship doesn't seem to be doing so good. Look, if the new versions are supposed to make the, make the Bible easier to understand and produce a more mature Christian, they ain't working. They are not working. A, the, the average evangelical knows less theology and less Bible now than they did 30 years ago before any of those versions came out. Yeah. And I don't care what you say about it, it's a fact. But they made lots of money. They made a lot of money doing it, and they sold a bill of goods to the evangelical world that all this that these versions are easier to read and easier to understand, and all it's done is make them more lazy. But I know I'm not supposed to say this and be unkind. And I'm, if I'm, I get fired up about this stuff here a little bit because this is the basic stuff of our faith, folks. So, Mike, to answer your question, it, it shouldn't surprise you that Schaff and that, that that these guys would say the things that they do because who are they really fundamentally? Now, the average evangelical doesn't know any of this stuff. They don't know what they, who's Shaf, who's Shelley, what's the critical text, what's this, what well, they don't even know. So you can't you can't necessarily fault them for not knowing, but the guys that are running the, the seminaries and running the schools that should know, the reason they don't is because they have a fundamental view, just like I'm talking about here, when it comes to church history, they've said that we're going to have our own authority other than what the word of God is. Comment? Response. Amen. Yeah. I would say the Catholics know even less than that. Oh, they do. And without a doubt. What is textual criticism? Just think about the term. Criticizing of God's word. It's it, it's what Paul says. It's man's ideas about how to be critical of the word of God. Now, does that sound like anything that a Bible-believing person would want to be too involved in? Not to me. Because what are they fundamentally doing? They're standing over and above Scripture and being critical of it from the start. Thus the term textual criticism. I'm just a dumb guy who's just willing to believe that, God's, that God meant what He said and said what He meant. That when he said, I inspired, that, that he gave the word by inspiration, that he said he would preserve that which he inspired, and that that preserved, inspired word needs to be rightly divided. And when you do those things, it'll lead you to where God's truth is, and anything else is just man's wisdom. Alright, well, we really got to quit. Would you get all that, Norm? <laughs>